record here. Any questions about the exam? No? Okay. Um, I'm going to be doing some early performance feedback this week that I think looks at people that don't have a C and above and says, you know, do they need help? Do they not? It's like a yes, no thing that helps people in social 100 and other classes. This one too, um, 220, just gauge if you're on track. So if you get an email from early performance feedback, it doesn't mean it's the end of the world. It just means that they're going to reach out to you, you know, about making sure that you stay on top of things this semester. And of course, you know that I do that for you as well. Samuel, did you have COVID? I hope you're feeling better. Um, I know that you had mentioned something about that last week. So I hope everybody is good. A uh, little chicken drama. Um, not too much though, but these, you should really know just actually how cold resistant chickens are. They are very cold resistant. Um, uh, but uh, so we only lost one chicken over the last few days and I'm talking negative, negative, negatives out here, which is pretty amazing because they also huddle together and can trample each other. So things went pretty well uh, over the weekend, but definitely on a farm, lots to consider, uh, chickens, the tractor, things like that. Uh, anyway, let's talk about briefly uh, Texas keeping themselves warm with socialism. Oh, oh, Jason, you went there. Yes, I did go there. Um, Texas uh, having a big uh, cold like everywhere else. Um, so if you've been reading about this, ever wonder why Texas has to do things like rolling blackouts during extreme weather. Uh, they are the only state that has isolated their power grid from the rest of the country in order to avoid federal regulation. Um, besides that, you may have been hearing that wind turbines uh, were failing and freezing up, um, coal, nuclear power plants. Look, their entire industry there has been hit. It is not the fault of green energy. And yes, all of a sudden, Texas is okay with asking for socialism, help from the government. Um, and uh, of course, Biden said, well, you're not a blue state, so no. Oh, of course he didn't say that. He said, yes, uh, let's help your state out in any way that we can. And if you detect a little saltiness with me, it's because the former president let my state burn for months and months and months because we were a blue state, which I can't still wrap my head around. But uh, Texas is, is uh, experiencing this. Now we have to understand also that this is because of a lack of mitigation. Why are they experiencing this? Because the Republican governors and state Senate have been aware of climate change and its impact for years and years, and they have chosen to spend the money elsewhere. No, they did not weatherize and winterize vehicles. No, they are not prepared with their infrastructure. I think 40% of it is natural gas. They were not prepared for this, but not because they were not aware of it. They were not prepared because they chose to spend that money that they would have put into mitigation elsewhere. So now they can do what they say they hate doing, which is asking for a handout from the government. Look, we know that climate change is real. And of course, the humane thing to do in any situation, whether your state's burning down or whether there are people that could die because of freezing cold weather, is to make sure they get that aid. But it's always interesting to me as we break this down and we understand just how political the environment or issues in the environment can be, even though they're not. Once human beings get a hold of them, this is a really perfect thing because online, like I said, there's a lot of these are wind turbines failing and it's because of green energy and it's not. It's absolutely not. Um, and they only put forth those ideas in a time of emergency to make those types of um, energy seem less viable, which, of course, they're very viable. Right. All right. Um, but it's good to know a little bit about what's going on in the world, especially when um, it's kind of a big deal, uh, you know, um, although people from the Midwest would say that they're used to the temperature, but that state is not equipped because they've not uh, spent the money for infrastructure. Most of Ed's families from Texas already been in a bunch of support your local oil refineries and drill mechanics through this crisis propaganda. Yeah, you know what's sad to me is that people take something life-threatening like a fire or like freezing temperatures and politicize it in favor of whatever agenda they have. Um, but that's, you know, not going to get us anywhere. You know, Texas needs to deal with the reality of climate change. This happens every couple of years there. This has not, not happened before. Again, it's just where they've chosen to put their money and they didn't do that. So now they'll ask for a handout. Um, you know, and of course, like I said, the humane thing to do 
is to make sure that people don't die and that they're prepared. But this is something that they brought on themselves. Let's be realistic. Okay. Um, today we are going to watch the Paul Stamets piece. I'm introducing this because we're getting into the chapter on biodiversity. I think this chapter is awesome. Uh, I think that it's worth every second of it. And I would take notes. I have a lot of questions from the next exam and you're doing a paper on it, right? Uh, your second solution thing is about this Paul Stamets video. So uh, we're taking care of this in real time, but he talks about a number of challenges where they said can't be done. And he came in with mushroom or mycelium as a fix, as a solution. Now, all of your papers are exactly about that. So write down in real time, all the ways that he's applying it because you can then pick one of those solutions that he's talking about in this video. All right, um, I'm going to mute uh, and stop my video for the first time this semester because nobody can mute me. I can't be stopped. Oh wait, I, I'll stop myself. Um, and. Uh, if you cannot hear the video, let me know, please. Um, and then I'll take care of it, okay? Or if you can hear me in the background sipping my coffee really loudly, please tell me also not to do that. All right. Yeah, we, can't we can't hear the video. that we have spore inoculated the entire audience. And, and in that we are, these colonies of microorganisms, I suggest to you that this gathering, we are creating a new macroorganism. And a new subset of Homo sapiens called Upliftonians. Perhaps we're a new breed of humans that will march into the future, I certainly hope so. So I'm gonna present to you in the next hour and a half a suite of, of revelations, solutions that can be put into practice, our story, that of my wife and I, on this long journey through life. And I have a lot of thank yous to give in the course of this. It's just not me. I'm one person along a, a long chain of other mycologists and, and visionaries who've carried the torch to pass it on to the next generation. A Native American elder, I think, put it wonderfully when he said that we did not inherit our environments from our ancestors, we borrow it from our descendants. And I think that there's a lot of truth to that. So before I launch into my, my presentation, a lot of you are probably wondering about this very cool hat that I have. It's my favorite hat, it makes me look really good. Uh, and this hat is actually made from a mushroom called Amadou. You'll be seeing some of the Amadou mushrooms. Amadou was uh, first described in 450 years uh, BC by Hippocrates as an anti-inflammatory. It's one of the most old, oldest known medicinal mushrooms. Amadou is the reason why a lot of us were able to migrate into Africa. There's no doubt that we're Africans at heart. 
We migrated into Europe several hundred thousand years ago. We discovered something new called winter. Oops. And this mushroom allowed for the portability of fire. You can put fire inside this mushroom and carry it for days, literally. So the fire keepers in, in, in indigenous tribes were, were, had a very practical role that was extremely important for the survival of the clan. If you traveled into the wintertime, you lost the ability of making fire, of course your clan could, could freeze to death. And this hat is actually made by some ladies in Transylvania. And through that tradition, through time, this mushroom and this technology of using these mushrooms uh, has survived. Now, I believe that mushrooms, plants, and other substances become shamanistically important because of a confluence of beneficial characteristics. The fact that this mushroom can be used for carrying fire, the fact that it can be boiled in hot water, delaminate into this fabric that can be made for warm, for clothing, smeared with animal grease, it becomes very, uh, very waterproof, but this hat is highly flammable. So if anyone's smoking a cigarette or a joint near me, I'm always really worried, <laughs> whoosh, my hat will catch on fire and I'll burn up. Um, but this uh, mushroom also revolutionized warfare because even though uh, the Chinese invented gunpowder, the Europeans invented the, the rifle, but this was the major punk that started, that ignited the flint spark that, that then subsequently ignited the gunpowder. So from this mushroom, it gave a highly competitive advantage, not only to indigenous cultures, but also helped, helped in many revolutions in, in our technologies. So this is our great planet that we, we, we abide upon, or we, it's our abode. And I suggest to you that the path into the, into the future for sustainability will be the path of following mycelium. I call this mycelial earth. So I'd like to give gratitude to my mentors. These are the four elders who have greatly influenced my life. And I met these individuals when I was 18 years of age. We have uh, Dr. Uh, Alexander Smith from the University of Michigan, Professor Emeritus, Dr. Daniel Stuntz from the University of Washington, Catherine Skates from uh, Post Falls, Idaho, and then Dr. Michael Bug. These three individuals have passed on, but it's only because of their kindness and generosity that I am here today. And I hold that trust and their respect and my respect for them as something that is extremely valuable to me. It was amazing that they took me under their wing because in the 1970s, uh, it was a very upheaval time. And it was especially amazing because these individuals were what you would call politi politically conservative people. And so when I showed up in their laboratories, this is what I looked like. <laughs> Your suspicions are now confirmed. <laughs> um, so let's go back in time. 7,000 years ago on the Sicilian and Jar Plateau in northern Algeria, on the, on, the, on the edge of the encroachment of the Sahara Desert, there was a labyrinthine cave complex where hundreds and hundreds of cave art uh, pictographs have been found. And uh, these pictographs were renowned to anthropologists and archaeologists, so they went to this area to study them. And they, it was called the Sicilian and Jar Plateau, which means the Plateau of Running Rivers. And they traveled on camelback. La Haute is a, a French anthropologist, Yamaguchi was a Japanese photographer. And they got to this labyrinthine cave complex, and they expected they would find water, and they were shocked. There's there no water to be found. They only had a few days' ration of water, and so they went deeper and deeper into the labyrinthian cave complex. And the story goes that when, you, when you're really thirsty, you can smell water. And, and the deeper you went into the earth, of course, it'd be more likely you'd find water. And one of their scouts came and crawled on, a, on his hands and knees through a little tunnel and came to a cavernous chamber and raised his lantern and almost dropped it in fright when he saw this 10-foot uh, bee-like figure, bee-man figure, as it's known as, etched on, on the walls. And in that cavern, they found a spring. So it was a shamanistically powerful spot. And they then photographed it. This is a reiteration by my friend Jonathan Meter. And what's shocking to me is in the four scientific articles that I've read, talking about the bee man, not a single scientist dare would even uh, speculate what the artist's intent was. Clearly, the artist was excited about mushrooms. Because, and this is the unfortunate malaise of our scientific investigations into, into mushrooms. People make fun of them, and the scientists do not want to be made fun of. 
And so it has now permeated throughout science historically, we call it mycophobia, the irrational fear of fungi and mushrooms. And mycophilia is this the opposite, which I'm infected by. I love mushrooms. Can't you tell? Um, and so uh, but I think this is also understandable because the viewscape of our encounters with mushrooms is so temporarily short. We see plants and animals. We engage them for weeks, months, years. Mushrooms come up, and then they disappear very, very rapidly. That which can cure you, that which can kill you, that which can you send you into the cosmos on psychedelic trips, for that to be so ephemeral means the learning experience window is so attenuated. So it's, that's not surprising. But what is shocking and surprising to me is a scientific biological racism against mushrooms to be treated seriously. I hope I will dissuade anyone of this argument you know, after this talk. On the border of Italy and Austria, Austria is to the north in the upper part of the slide, Italy's on the, on the south, there was an amazing discovery in 1991. And the, a, a, an individual, a Neolithic human, was found in September 1991. And the location was here. It's actually right on the inside of the border of Italy. And this is the border here. And so Austria is here, and here is Italy. And the famous Otzi was found. These are photographs of my friend Reinhard Poder. And Otzi was the best found preserved human remains in a non-funeral setting ever discovered. He died sort of intact, you know, on, on his adventure through, through the Alps. And he had with him two polypore mushrooms. He had the birch polypore, Piptoporus betulinus, very interesting mushroom, hyperaccumulus betulin, good for the immune system. And he had also with him amadou, this hat is made from amadou, Fomis fomentarius. Now, this fabric you see on the right, that's the actual material the Iceman had in his pouch. Tethered to his right side, these two mushrooms were ready at hand. Now, I carry my knife, my car keys, when I'm right-handed, the things that are most important to you, they're essential that you know where they are at all times, you tether to your right side. And he had these two mushrooms with him because they were so important for his survival. Obviously, they could then be able to create fire, just one spark into that fabric, you blow into it, and it becomes extremely flammable. So that was how important this was in his survival uh, uh, toolkit, is to have these mushrooms uh, uh, clearly close by. Then we advanced forward, and I could show you lots of examples. I'm just going to show you two. This is the legend of the origination of the myths uh, of the seasons in, in Greek myth. And this is Demeter giving Persephone a mushroom before she descends into the underworld and denoting the onset of, of, of winter. And she is then into the underworld, she goes to sleep, she's with Hades, and then upon her rebirth is the rebirth of spring. And the Eleusinian Mysteries, some of you have read about this, I highly recommend the Karl Ruck book that goes into this in great detail. So this advances to about 450 BC and then to current times. My wife, Dusty, and I spend a lot of time in the old growth forest, and I give her great thanks because she returned me to the old growth forest after a hiatus. And this is one of our favorite places that we go in the old growth forest in the Northern Olympic uh, uh, National Park of Washington State. Now, there is a thread of a trail there, but what's so interesting to us mycologists is more mushrooms grow along the trail than they, are, than they do in the woods because mushrooms are trail followers. They've learned that animals, including us humans, we can carry spore mass to new environments. So they populate upon debris fields, and mushrooms are extremely good at taking advantage of catas catastrophes, catastrophia. And we are the largest walking catastrophe on this planet. And as a result, mushrooms trail behind us. And then we get spores upon us, and I bring them to you. And here we are. So I want to give you a short biology lesson in the field of mycology. And this is something that really has come into focus by scientists only in the past 20 years. All plants are part fungi. Plants cannot exist without fungi. So here we have a cross-section of an ecosystem. There's a parasitic fungi that obviously kill trees. And then they can grow saprophytically, many of them. And some, most of the saprophytic mushrooms are not parasitic. They just grow on dead material, so they don't, don't harm plants. And then there is a group of the endophytic mushroom species, tremendously important. These give thermotolerance to plants. They can survive up to 140 degrees uh, uh, Fahrenheit temperatures. 
The endophytic fungi are extremely numerous. 200 to 400 species of endophytic fungi inside of trees, inside the leaves and the stems. They grow parallel. Scientists for years were trying to figure out when they cultured plants, why they kept on getting these fungal contaminants. And it took a long time for scientists to realize that those contaminants in the petri dish were not contaminants at all. They were endophytic fungi that were part of the guild that created the host defense colonies of complexity that gave plants the ability to resist disease. And so then we look at the mycorrhizal fungi. These four guilds, the parasitic, the saprophytic, the endophytic, and the mycorrhizal fungi, is what gives these plants the ability to sustain over the long term, to, to survive drought conditions, predators, sudden changes in, in climate, um, et cetera. And so we know now there's up to 400 to 500 species in play as mutualistic complex complementary uh, colonies surrounding all these plants then that's what makes a, a healthy he, uh, ecosystem healthy. An excellent book I, re I recommend is Mycorrhizal Symbiosis, and this is one by Smith and Reed. And on the right, you see a root stem, and this is the mycelium actually is wicks up under moist conditions, and that's, for, that's the mycorrhizal fungi wicking up, and it exhales carbon dioxide, inhales oxygen. And this is what we do as well. We are more closely related to fungi than we are to any other kingdom. 650 million years ago, we split from fungi. Our proto-ancestors are fungi. We are the children of fungi. A new super kingdom has been erected in the Journal of Eukaryotic Microbiology in 2006, called Opaistakanta, joining the kingdom of fungi uh, uh, together with animalia, animals. And because of our close evolutionary association, we exhale carbon dioxide, inhale oxygen, and we, and our cells under the microscope look very, very similar. So immediately upon germination of seeds, they look for a fungal ally. They need a fungal associate to help them protect themselves from diseases. So this is a group of garden seeds that are uh, germinating all unified with a single mycorrhizal fungus that's sharing nutrients. And the fungi, when they're growing, they do so much. Not only do they expand the root zones literally by hundreds of thousands of times, but they are also able to interplay within the ecosystem in ways that heretofore were not understood. My, one of my employees is a great skeptic. He doesn't believe that mycorrhizal fungi would help plants. And so we said, oh, great. Then you do the experiments. And so he grew up some California poppies. You can see the difference. With and without mycorrhizal fungi, the mycorrhizal fungi grow, uh, help the plants grow so well. There's a maple trees, and there's also a conifer trees there. The same situation. The seeds uh, were germinated with and without mycorrhizal fungi, and you can see there's a dramatic increase in growth. Dusty and I were very fortunate. Actually, I owe a thank you to George uh, W. Bush. Um, we do, because when he got elected, Dusty and I bought land in Canada. <laughs> um, so this is uh, some land that we bought in Canada. It's, um, it's, uh, we, have, uh, we planted 37,000 trees, and uh, we, we did 37,000 trees, half of which with mycorrhizal fungi, half of which without. We left the roads there. It was logged because they're ecological div division zones. Mycorrhizal fungi cannot go through mineral earth. They need the root, uh, roots. And so the roads were ecological barriers separating the treatments. And I'm very happy to say this has been a labor of love. Uh, Jim Gouin and, and David Price and David Summerlin are three of our great allies, and they've been painstakingly putting and measuring uh, 1,100 trees and putting them into Excel spreadsheets over the past seven years. And so for the first time, I'm delighted to show this, we have liftoff. And what you know, it's hard to see this chart, but basically the blue line is showing a, a statistically significant increase in the growth of the trees versus the, the trees that were not treated with mycorrhizal fungi. Statistically significant now. And it's taken us six to seven years and at 10 years. The reason why we are doing this experiment is we could not find a single scientific article where they tested, if your metric is only timber board feet of lumber, which I think is the wrong metric, but let's say that's a metric that you have to fight against with a capitalistic system that's in place, then is it better to leave the wood chips and you know, the, the debris in the forest, don't burn, let it mulch, and then introduce mycorrhizal fungi? I think we can make that case. 
Now, the, the ecological metric being so narrowly defined in the timber, port of, uh, timber feet of, of lumber is obviously a poor metric. But this is the balance in the equations that we have to be up against in order to prove that there is a better way. So we're very delighted that now we are seeing a separation uh, and we continue this and you'll notice that the lines are, are, are spreading apart. So we will achieve greater statistical significance over time. Dusty and I, when we go into the old growth forest, it is a sacred, sacred place. And many ecologists didn't fully understand that these forests do so much more. Not only are they the greatest reservoir of above ground storage of carbon on the planet, but they are a pedestal for ecosystems and ecosystem recoveries. They are giant genetic libraries. And in this photograph, you'll see that these hemlock trees, which are here, are underneath these giant old growth trees. And scientists wondered how is it possible that these hemlock trees could have enough light to photosynthesize. It's really dark in the old growth forest. And so they took the hemlock trees, they took them into a greenhouse, they gave the same amount of light as in the old growth forest, they all died. They go, well, how are they getting their nutrients? There's a big conundrum, a big mystery. And so scientists then said, well, let's, let's radioactively tag carbon and nitrogen. Arnebrandt and Samard, 1994-1996 then published their, their work, which was astonishing and revolutionized our understanding of ecosystems and the role that fungi play. These hemlock trees, you can call them pines if you, if, if you wish, uh, were, they found this, were getting nutrients, carbon and nitrogen, hundreds and hundreds of feet away from deciduous trees, from birch and alder trees. They were in the more sunlit areas. And via the mushroom mycelium, the mushroom mycelium had a mothering influence, bidirectionally budgeting nutrients, guaranteeing the plurality and biodiversity of the ecosystem so the ecosystem would benefit as a whole. The loss of these species within the ecosystem can dismantle the ecosystem and take it apart. We have now entered into 6X, the sixth greatest extinction event known in the history of life on this planet and we are losing more species than we can discover them. And this estimated by Dr. E.O. Wilson from Harvard that we'll lose 50% of the known species in the next 100 years. This is the greatest extinction event ever known in the history of life on this planet. Like rivets on an airplane, how many species will we, we, will we lose before we have catastrophic failure? We're approaching that now. And so under this understanding now of massive ecological collapse throughout the entire world, there's a few of us biologists and scientists and many of the people here who realize it is a time to take action and we need to act extremely quickly. So when the trees climax, they fall and then they begin to decompose. But so many other things are occurring. So basically, in simplistic terms, fungi take wood or straw or, or grasses, they colonize it and ultimately soil is being created. Fungi are the great molecular disassemblers of nature, the soil magicians. They build the very lenses of soils upon which we walk. And here is an example of how thin that lens of soil is. In the, in the millions of years of evolution, we exist on such a thin layer of soil. Gardeners and farmers knew that, know this. The loss of soil impairs their ability to grow food. The loss of soil around the planet right now is a huge threat to, to our sustainability. In the Pacific Northwest, we can go back 10,000 years to the last ice age. And as the ice glaciers receded, and those of you who have been around glaciers, there are moraine fields, gravel beds, almost no plants. But 10,000 years ago, as, ice, ice, uh, as the glaciers receded, there was uh, uh, small lenses of soil, uh, just a few feet in diameter. And many of you have seen these little plants come up. Well, the plants would grow, they'd the climax, they would die, they would rot and then the lens becomes a little bit larger. The tentacles of the mycelium is racing out, foraging for water and bringing in nutrients. More plants would ascend, they climax, they die, they decompose, the lens becomes larger. And yet in only 10,000 years, we have this much soil that our lives are dependent upon. I think we should pay attention. So the mushroom mycelium is triggered into mushroom formation from four primary environmental stimuli. Obviously, the Lots of water helps, so we've had surges of rain, so lots of mushrooms are coming up now. As the mycelium is, is, gets watered, uh, it, leak, it reaches up into the top layers of the soil, and then it inhales oxygen, exhales carbon dioxide. And the mycelium, when it's exposed to water and there's evaporation, there's a drop in temperature. And then there's exposure to light. 
99.9% .9 of the mushrooms, I dare say, are photodependent. They will not form in the absence of light. The mycelium will grow, but no mushrooms will form. So these four primary stimuli is, are the ones that trigger mushrooms into mushroom formation. And so the mushrooms then mature very, very quickly. And then here's an example of day 23 on straw. The straw is inedible. Day, day 25, day 27. And up to 20% of that mass of straw becomes an edible food substance, high enough in protein, up to 40% protein that's edible to humans. So these are magical ability to growing food in a very, very short time. But I became fascinated by, well, the mushrooms come up in four or five days, they're gone. But why do they decompose? How do they decompose? So I began to study the decomposition of rotting mushrooms. And this opened up a whole new arena of thinking to me that has been quite uh, rewarding and surprising. So here's a mushroom past its prime. It's sporulated. There's lots of spores in the ground around this mushroom. Spores germinate. The mushroom mycelium forms. And then a few days later, it goes subterranean. There can be more than eight miles of mycelium in a cubic inch. That's how dense and how fine these filaments are. My foot, I estimate, covers 300 miles of mycelium. The mycelium then forms this wonderfully articulated web. I'm going to show you some of my scanning electron micrographs. I was scanning an electron microscope of this for many years. And so looking at, under the SEM, looking at the mushroom formation, the mycelium, I was just fascinated. It's a perfectly articulated filtration membrane. And then looking at this and then looking at it closer, I began to really focus in on how, these, how, they are, how organized the mycelial networks were. And the mycelium, when it forms these cavities, they swell with water. So these are like little bladders, little reservoirs of water. And then as the rain stop, and then these little cavities lose their water one at a time. So myceliated environments are spongy environments. They retain water, and they do so much more. The pre-selectivity of the bacterial communities that are surrounding the mycelium are determined by the antibiotical preferences of the mycelium that chooses the, the bacteria that are beneficial to the plants that give rise to the plants that create the debris fields that then fall into the forest that feed the mycelium. These are deterministic sequences of decomposition. And so here is the mycelium growing over about 45 minutes. First there is territorial conquest, and then there is consolidation. This is a photographic movies by my friend Patrick Hickey. And then when Patrick produced this, it was, it was a game changer. These are hyper uh, accumulate, this is hypernucleation. These are bundles of nuclei, hundreds of nuclei per cell that are streaming through the networks of the mycelium. And at the very tips of the mycelium, it's especially hypernuclear. Notice that they don't all go in one direction. 95% of them go in one direction and 5% of them go against the cytoplasm. Now, in a meter diameter uh, uh, mushroom uh, lens, there can be trillions and trillions and trillions of end branchings. Think of them as little scientists all doing experiments. If there is a new insect, a new toxin, a new potential food source, a new adversary, if there's a recombination of genetic material because of epigenesis, and if there is a success of a recombination expression within the genome, and a new antibiotic, a new enzyme, a new strategy for gobbling up that potential new food source, if that occurs, what happens? The mycelium streams forward, has captured more food, and then the information back channels to the entire net. These are self-educating membranes. These are not only externalized lungs, not only do they externally digest their nutrients and bring them in through their cell walls, and the reason why we split from fungi, we went the route of encapsulating our nutrients into a stomach, a cellular sac, digesting our food within. The mycelium chose the path of digesting its nutrients externally. So I propose to you that these are not only externalized lungs, not only externalized stomachs, but these are externalized neurological membranes. And a lot of people accused me in the 1990s when I postulated this, that I was eating too many magic mushrooms. I do not deny that. <laughs> And then the Japanese scientists came out with this great article on a maze uh, where a slime mole was put into the center of a maze. And it's given five different outlets. And then the uh, slime mold is growing through the maze. And then when they gave the, uh, the uh, two oat flakes at uh, two of the five outlets, then the, when they reintroduced, after the slime mold discovered those two oat flakes, when they removed the slime mold and then reintroduced it, 
It memory mapped the shortest locations uh, necessary to find the food without producing extraneous cell matter, you know, and finding dead ends. So they postulated, well, the slime mold looks like it has a demonstrated cellular intelligence. They also were criticized. But thankfully, another group of Japanese said, well, let's, let's see what happens if we tried to redesign the Japanese subway system with a slime mold. And so this is Tokyo. These are the satellite cities around Tokyo. Uh, and these are basically food uh, points of nutrition. The slime mold is introduced at zero hours. And at five hours, it's growing out. 11 hours, it's growing out pretty randomly. And at 26 hours, it shuts down all the non-essential pathways and reconnects and redesigns the Japanese subway system in a more optimal manner than it is designed today. And then the Japanese scientists said, well, how, how, how well did this slime mold design this new subway system? And this is where the mathematicians came in and they had a startling result. It optimized mathematically. It achieved a 99% perfection of proof in designing a subway system more efficiently than that that any of the human engineers had discovered. So if you have an engineering problem, maybe you want to consult a slime mold. So. I'm going to wax poetic here, but this is central to my belief. I believe that the mycelium is aware, it is sentient, and it has a neurological archetype, that which we share as well. These are astrocytes by Hank Morgan, a neurologist. And looking at the mushroom mycelium um, and looking at how it's organized, it has cross hatchings. Engineers, uh, computer engineers call these hop points. And for every branch and length going in one direction, there's another branching in another, in another direction. This allows then, if there's a breaking in the mycelial mat, there's an alternative way of transferring information and nutrients. So I postulated with the help of my wife that the mycelium is Earth's natural internet. And the invention of the computer internet came in a time critical where we had to share information when we we're facing these extinction events and the invention of the computer internet is an inevitable consequence of a previously proven evolutionary successful model. I'm an amateur astronomer, and when I look at the organization of dark matter and dark energy, and this is one example of that, it also conforms to the same mycelial archetype. And then going way out, and this is a deep field view from the Hubble telescope, those are individual galaxies that you see and they're embedded within the cobweb of dark matter. I wonder, are we looking at cosmic consciousness? I believe matter begets life. Life becomes single cells. Single cells become strings. Strings branch, become chains. Chains become membranes. And this is the way. I believe we'll find network-based organisms throughout the cosmos. It's inevitable and they're likely to be fungal in form, and we're likely to find externalized neurological networks throughout all ecosystems and uh, throughout all planets that harbor life. So, the first organisms to come to land were fungi. 1.3 billion years ago, fungi march on the land. Now, fungi do a lot of things, and there's a lot of discussion of water. Many of you may not know that fungi generate water. That's why compost piles sweat, and there's puddles around them. These fungi produce these extracellular metabolites and these little water droplets full of enzymes and acids, and also producing a very interesting group of crystals called oxalic acids. The oxalic acid has an appetite for minerals, and so it pulls calcium out of rocks, iron, manganese, all sorts of other minerals, and forms calcium oxalates, an insoluble salt. And so the, in doing so, it sequesters carbon dioxide, it actually builds the carbon bank within the soil. And then the, car, the calcium oxalate crystals being insoluble, they react to the enzymes and acids of other adjacent organisms. So my work with Battelle Laboratories, we discovered that on osmotic pressure waves, the advancing mycelium will send a cascade of oxalic acid crystals in advance of contact with a potential pathogen, adversary, food source, whatever. And as the crystals then are destroyed from the enzymatic and acid reactions, then a secondary reaction occurs that alerts the immune system of the mushroom mycelium to produce a customized antibiotic specific to the target of the pathogen in advance of contact. 
These are messenger crystals. They are thinking outside of the box. And so I would find rocks. I'd tip them over. And I'd go, oh, there's mycelium. How cute. Oh, nice. And it took me forever to realize they are not just existing there. They consume rocks. They eat rocks. And this is how plants get their minerals. Fungi eat rocks. And by pockmarking the rocks, pulling out the calcium and iron and other minerals, the rocks become more fragile. They have little hollow points now. They can collect water. It begins the begin, uh, it's the beginning of the creation of soils. So we advanced now to 420 million years ago. This fossil was first discovered in 1859 in Saudi Arabia. 420 million years ago, laying down about a meter tall, this was the tallest organism on land. And it was a big mystery for hundreds of years until Dr. Kevin Boyce in the Journal of Geology published in uh, January of 2007 finally solved the riddle of what prototoxides was. Now, 420 million years, years ago, this is before vascular plants, before flying insects, and there's just kind of creeping crud on the ground. But this organism stood out. And we know that it was not lying down three meters high. It was up to 30 to 40 feet long, dotting across the place, uh, the, the, the surface of the earth, were giant fungal forms. And these were the tallest organisms on earth at the time that electrostatic fields were extremely active, lots of lightning. They would attract lightning strikes. You can draw your own conclusions for that, but what a great uh, uh, habitat for epigenesis and for the creation of new life forms. And so these survived from 420 million years ago to 380 million years ago. Then we advanced the time of uh, Pangaea when the continents were all connected. 250 million years ago at the PET boundary, the Permian Triassic boundary, there was a great cataclysmic event, a huge extinction event. More than 95% of the species on the planet became suddenly extinct. There's three competing theories. An asteroid impact is one. Volcanoes in Eurasia, possible. Methane hydrate bursts from the ocean, also possible. I don't see these as mutually exclusive. An asteroid impact could have triggered the earthquakes to cause the fissures of the volcanoes to spew, and the methane hydrate bursts occurred. The earth was covered with dust. Sunlight was choked out, and fungi inherited the earth. Those organisms that paired with fungi tend to survive. And in fact, in the fossil record, they discovered the fungus that gobbled up the forest. It's called Reduvia sporonides. And so this forest gobbling fungus could exist, gobbled up the wood debris over thousands and thousands and thousands of years. The sky is eventually cleared, sunlight returned, and then we ended in the time of Gondwana land, 140 million years ago, and the continents began to separate from continental drift. And so we advance forward, and then 65 million years ago, we have another cataclysmic extinction event. An asteroid impact hits the Earth. It's repeated, huge amounts of debris field jettisoned into the atmosphere, sunlight cut off, and fungi re-inherit the earth. And those organisms that paired with fungi survived. There is a teaching lesson here, folks. We have now entered into 6X, but this extinction event is unique. It is not caused by a methane hydrate burst. It's not caused by an asteroid impact or a volcano. It is the first extinction event that we know that is caused by an organism, us. We are not only will be the victims of this, of this organism, but we are indeed that organism itself. So that asteroid impact occurred in the Yucatan. You all know the story. The dinosaurs became extinct, and we marched forward. In present day, the largest organism in the world is a mycelial mat in eastern Oregon. It's in the John Day wilderness. And I found out about it. It was reported in the literature, the largest contiguous organism in the world. So I hired an airplane and I flew down there. It kills the forest. It's a forest pathogen. It's a honey mushroom, delicious mushroom. Uh, but it kills the forest. So the Forest Service cuts down the trees because of forest fires because they're at the tops of the hills. And so I flew down there. We couldn't find it. And I flew down there again. And, uh, and this time was we, we got the coordinates and on this little tiny airplane. It's a canvas airplane. And, and we went up and up. And, and we couldn't, I couldn't get the whole organism in the photograph. And so I asked the pilot to go higher and higher. And, you know, it's a little prop plane. And so the, the propellers are spinning like crazy and, you know, stressed out. And we get higher and higher. We're up to 14,000, 15,000 feet. And I told the pilot, I think I'm going to faint. And he goes, me too. <laughs> Not a good sign. But I said, well, let me get a photograph first. And so I took this photograph. It's 2,200 acres in size. 
1,665 football fields, and it's one cell wall thick. Think of that. There are chains of cells, but it's only one cell wall thick. On the other side of that are hundreds of millions of microbes that are trying to consume it. How is it is they able to achieve that mass? It speaks to the cellular intelligence and the evolutionary strategy of the, these epigenic organi organized learning cell mats to be able to, to come up with strategies to achieve this mass. And so Jonathan Quinton's gonna be talking after me. He inspired me, he gave a fantastic talk. I'm glad he's coming up again. And some of the cultures that we get in the culture uh, follow the golden mean. They form spirals. And then what I found, this photograph from the U.S. Forest Service forming a spiral of the honey mushroom in Montana, this struck me as being one of the universal truths that we all share. So the mycelium is then triggered into mushroom formation, four different elements, increase in water, in a drop in temperature because of evaporation, uh, inhaling oxygen, exhaling carbon dioxide, exposure to light. And then the, mu the mushrooms, as they begin to form, at the tips of the mycelium, it again becomes hyper uh, hypernucleate, hundreds of nuclei per, per cell, which then segregate just the two nuclei per cell later on. But at the tips, it tends to be very, very rich. And so the primordia begin to form, and they develop very quickly, and for the first time, I'm showing you a time lapse that's successful. Now, one of my nicknames is Stamina Stamets. I will not give up. And I, I'm seriously, 19 out of 20 of my time lapses fail. I kick the tripod, the mushrooms don't behave. I mean, a thousand different reasons. But so I just got this, you know, converted. I just finished this just before I got on the airplane. And so the first time ever, I'm gonna show you something I'm very proud of. This is Trofaria rugosa annulata the garden giant. This is a five-day sequence in the development of the fruit bodies from the mycelium. The mycelium can be resident for hundreds of years, literally, and the mushrooms can only form, and they will form within just a few days. Yay! <laughs> so powerful are mushrooms, they can punch through concrete or asphalt. Some of the work I did in the late 1990s with Battelle Laboratories was the decomposition of hydrocarbons, oil in particular, particularly Bunker C oil that's used in the ships. There's an experiment outside of Bellingham, Washington, in the United States, where the Department of Transportation had a bus yard where trucks and buses were stored, and they leaked so much hydrocarbon and oil into the soil, the Department of Ecology said, you have a toxic waste site, you need to clean it up. The Department of Transportation put out a contest. Okay, let's see if there's a remediation strategy because it's so expensive to scoop up all that soil. And so we, we were work, I was working with the Battelle Laboratory, so we put in our application, we were accepted. And there were four piles. One pile is a control pile, one was treated with bacteria by a bacterial remediation company, one was treated with enzymes by a chemical company, and then we came in and we inoculated our pile with oyster and mushroom mycelium. And the oyster mushroom mycelium, we had already demonstrated, absorbs the oil. The mycelium is white, and then it becomes black. And the mycelium is producing extracellular enzymes that break down lignin and cellulose that are linked together carbon and hydrogen. And so we discovered that the mycelium breaks down hydrocarbons and then remanufactures them into fungal carbohydrates. So it dismantles them into elemental forms. So when we came back six weeks later, the first pile, dead, dark, and stinky, 20,000 parts per million of PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And the second pile with enzymes, same story, dead, dark, and stinky, high in hydrocarbons, no chains, the bacteria is the same. And we came to our pile and we removed the tarps and there were gasps of astonishment by the government officials and the scientists when our pile was covered with hundreds and hundreds of giant oyster mushrooms. And some of these are very large, happy mushrooms. So, then the mushrooms then sporulated on top of the oil-saturated soil. And again, because of epigenesis, the influence of the environment on the expression genetically, then the, we can train these strains that have greater aptitude and skill sets for breaking down these hydrocarbon-saturated soils. So our pile, upon a final analysis at 12 weeks, went from 20,000 parts per million to less than 200. Phenomenal success, approved for freeway landscaping, and then this story really made scientific headlines around the world. But then the mushrooms then sporulated, and then they rotted, and the bacteria started growing. And then something astonishing happened. 
is that we, the our pile became an oasis of life. Birds came in after the maggots that the flies had laid eggs into the rotting mushrooms and maggots grew and the birds came in. They brought in seeds. And our pile became an oasis of life for the plurality of different plant species. And the three other piles were made dead, dark, and stinky, and lifeless. And then I realized that these primary saprophytes are gateway species that lead downstream to the proliferation of other biological systems. They unlock the door and lower the toxicity levels so other communities of organisms can proliferate. So you can... You can take an, an oyster mushroom kit grown from any company, produces three to five flushes. After that, there's not enough nutrition for it to grow. So you can break it up, take the crankcase oil out of your car, pour it on, and boy, more mushrooms will grow. Um, the mushrooms we analyzed had no hydrocarbons whatsoever. But because of the metal tailings and the gears, the mushrooms do hyperaccumulate heavy metals. So we don't recommend that people eat mushrooms around these toxic waste sites. But we found something truly, truly remarkable that's excited people all over the world. Well, we have these unfortunate teaching moments, is what I like to calling them. You know, we have the Exxon Valdez in Alaska, Costco, Busan, and the San Francisco Bay, and the BP oil spill. I had literally hundreds of people write me, Paul, what would you do? What would you do? I've been doing remediation on land. So I thought about it, and I go, well, it's a saline environment. The mushrooms might produce these enzymes. They can break up the hydrocarbons. Let me think about it. And I thought, always challenge authority always question the beginning of the decision tree. Because so many mistakes steer us away from logical and exciting discoveries because of this belief that the expert knows more than I do. And so these alpha faculty professors who tell the students, no, don't do that, it doesn't work, they're dangerous. And so I invented mycobooms, hemp socks, full of oyster mushroom mycelium that you can use to corral. And then these hemp socks at first were expensive to produce, you know, through traditional methods. And then I discovered something that I did file a patent on it. I gave up on the patent. And this is revolutionary in its simplicity. It's taken me 30 to 40 years to discover the simplest techniques. And we discovered a salt water fermentation system. We can take straw or wood chips, put it into salt water, let it sit. Salt water is not potable. You can't drink it. It's, it's abundant wherever there's oil spills, typically along coastal lines. There's reed grasses. You can then submerge it in salt water for a week to two weeks. It goes into an anaerobic state. And then we found that we pulled the straw and the wood chips out and laid it on a tarp. Oxygen became the sterilizer against the anaerobes. And then we can inoculate it with mushroom mycelium, and it grows beautifully. This is such a simple revolutionary method. Not only can it mitigate the effects of oil spills, but can help feed people in communities around the world. The mushrooms are saline to tolerant. I called Seth, uh, some of the mycologists, I said, well, oyster mushrooms tolerate uh, uh, salt water. They said, no, of course not. I said, well, did you try? He goes, no, but it's obvious. I go, well, I'm an idiot. It's not obvious to me. Let me try. So this is a method you'll hear a lot more in the ensuing months. We have now chosen these containers that are universal around the, the fruit and seafood industry. So we've been able to come up with a mechanizable system that we can expand throughout the entire world. And we had Chernobyl, another teaching moment. And Chernobyl, what was so interesting, the Ukrainian scientists in a downwind environment started analyzing the foods that the Ukrainian people were consuming, so concerned about radioactive fallout. And they found something astonishing. There was a mushroom that stood out, the hyperaccumulated cesium-137, more so than any other plant in the ecosystem, by orders of magnitude. And it is gomphidius glutinosus, called the hideous gomphidius. It's a mycorrhizal mushroom. This mushroom becomes highly radioactive, concentrating cesium-137, 10,000 times the background levels of the environment, and in doing so, decontaminates a large expanse of land. The mushrooms become radioactive, but then it lowers the toxic threshold levels, allowing the plurality and diversity in the proliferation of biological systems to recover. Why would a mushroom do that? We may not know why, but it speaks to the importance of mycodiversity, the diversity of these fungi. So then after Fukushima, I had all these people write me, Paul, what would you do? And so I immediately wrote, within a week of Fukushima, the nuclear force recovery zone. This has been translated into Japanese. It was presented in front of the Japanese a legislature, we have now formed a top-notch group of scientists who are on the cutting edge, 
We looked at all the other remediation strategies, and I proposed that we, we create an old growth forest around Fukushima. And then so we sequentially, over the generations, picked these mushrooms that hyperaccumulate cesium-137, and by doing so, to gradually detoxify the environment. There's no other alternative. There's more than 600 truckloads of soil being taken to toxic waste dumps that they're creating the size of 50 football fields. They're bringing in millions of gallons of water per day into Fukushima right now, which becomes radioactive that they cannot discharge. I know too much about Fukushima. It's an oncurring disaster. There is exposure a hundred times that of the tolerable limits more than 100 miles away from Fukushima. The population is immunologically depressed because the environment is becoming compoundedly more toxic. So, but from the Fukushima, and more so from Chernobyl, a group of scientists from Einstein University were looking at remote cameras and more than a million rads of radioactivity inside of Chernobyl. And they saw black molds growing on the, on the cement walls. There's no nutrition. How could these molds be growing? They went and they analyzed the molds and they found something heretofore unprecedented in this field of science. That under a million rads of radioactivities, these fungi flourished on concrete. And they discovered a new part of the life cycle of melanizing fungi, fungi that have the same pigments that we have. That the melanizing fungi can use gamma irradiation in a fashion similar and analogous to the way that plants use sunlight for cellular metabolism. Now, I was involved with Saifu Camp as a Googleplex from a, a TED spinoff. I met the head of the Martian landing mission. He says, it's, you know, six months to get to Mars, you know, one year on the planet, six months to get back, but the biggest problem is food. And I said, what are you going to do? He said, I want to tow greenhouses. And I said, in the vacuum of space? You know, that greenhouse, how are you going to insulate them? You know, I said, Gee, it's a huge problem. This discovery here may allow for the interplanetary colonization of space by growing fungal foods like tempeh. And moreover, we can have genomic libraries that can be within the space shuttles. And as we go to these other planets, that we can begin to terraform. We can terraform the planets using the gamma radiation you know, in the cosmos as well as the nuclear engines on the spaceships and then begin to create the lenses that I described earlier post the glacial period to create biospheres on other planets. So these accidents, as terrible as they are, can be teaching lessons. I really need to move fast now, folks. This is where Dusty and I live. We live on Skookum Inlet in Washington State. Four salmon runs a year, steelhead, you know, cutthroat trout, beautiful place. And actually, this photograph is important for me to tell you. I hired an airplane, and I flew around three times, and the window was always in the way for my photograph. So I told the pilot, go around one more time. I'm going to do something. Don't be concerned. He goes, what are you going to do? And I go, I paid you. And he goes, yeah, you paid me. I said, no, don't worry about it. Just do what I say. When I say, drop the wing. So he went around and ran around and I said, drop the wing, you know, and he dropped the wing. And so I opened up the door. I knew he wouldn't say I couldn't you know, open up the door. And so I took off my seatbelt. What I didn't know is that it was a slip lock seatbelt. I opened up the door of the airplane, I'm still going 120 miles an hour on a steep bank. And I fell out of the airplane. And I had one leg in the airplane and I had wrapped the seatbelt like this and I'm upside down. I thought, well, I'm here. I might as well take a photograph. Boom. <laughs> so. So this is, where, this is where Dusty and I live, right here, on Skookum Inlet. And right after I moved in, in 1984, a week later, the sheriff shows up with a summons. I thought, well, that was awfully quick. <laughs> I didn't have a chance to do anything illegal yet. <laughs> but every owner on this inlet was given a summons saying you had to replace your septic system within two years, it would be physically forced off your property. I bought a small farm, those small cows, chickens, and pigs. They more than double the next year. And so I couldn't afford to put in a $25,000 septic system, but I did something different. I put in wood chips and I inoculated with that mushroom, the garden giant mushroom, the King Stropharia. A year later, I had another fleet of uh, government officials show up in my driveway. They said, we've been monitoring the water coming off your property. And what did you do? You didn't play replace your septic, system, your septic system, did you? And I go, no. And I had more cows, more bio burden. I said, well, I put in these wood chips and I inoculated with mushroom mycelium of a mushroom that has an appetite for bacteria. That was the dawning of mycofiltration. I had a hundred to one reduction of bacteria, E. coli, coming off our property by using sheet mulches of mushroom mycelium. So the mushroom mycelium grows, it grows, it permeates the wood, it's very tenacious, it can hold more than 30,000 times its mass in a strand of mycelium. And the mycelium then can produce these 
bodacious mushrooms, which are then become full of maggots that can feed fish and salmon and trout. And so that was the dawning of the microfiltration and the mycelium then, and we tried to convince, uh, you know, that, that this could really help water quality around Mason County, Washington, where the shellfish industry and the seafood industry is so important. But there's no money. So Dusty and I uh, pro bono uh, 14 locations, and uh, our employees and ourselves went out, and we started putting in oyster mushrooms in burlap sacks around, uh, around streams that were choke points that were channeling E. coli from farms and parking lots and elsewhere, septic systems. So this is from the Mason County. The water is moving like this fast. The water is moving fairly quickly. Water does not discriminate between petroleum products and E. coli, so there's an obvious message here. And so directly afterwards, we did measurements here, measurements down here, and there was, a, generally speaking, a 10 to 1 reduction in fecal coliform E. coli bacteria. Fantastic success. And so then we got involved with the conservation districts of the United States. We made engineering diagrams. We produced a manual on this. It was free for anybody. And then we started, um, I, and then I had this epiphany that gourmet and medicinal mushroom farms should be localized around every major community and reinvented as healing arts centers. I really believe this is important. And I am institutes of applied mycology. This is what I want to dedicate my life to, to create throughout the entire world institutes of applied mycology reinvented as healing heart centers to help the immunological system of this planet. We share our immune systems with our environment via the mycelial bridges, the cellular bridges that join us together, but there's so much more. The extracellular metabolites contain within them other compounds. And within these compounds can be antibacterial and antiviral agents, besides the enzymes that break down oil and other uh, contaminants. So <laughs> I married the most wonderful woman in the world. It's true, folks. Be jealous. It's true. And I, I said, well, we have to go to an FDA-approved laboratory to measure whether these strains we have are truly uh, fighting bacteria. And so I submitted 10 strains to a laboratory and then I got the results back, and I got the bill, $25,000 bill. I went, oh, no, I got to tell Dusty. She was in charge of accounting and things. And I got, honey, we have a problem. And I said, uh, I did the research. I sent in the, the results. I got the results back. Here's the invoice, $25,000. And she goes, well, did we get good results? And I went, oh, yes. <laughs> That's good. We did. And there's a logarithmic scale. It's pretty simple to understand. 10 to the first power is 10 CFUs, colony-forming units. 10 little bacteria in a, in a gram of water, a milliliter of water. 10 to the third power is 1,000 bacteria in a milliliter of water. 10 to the sixth power is, is, is a million. 10 to the eighth power is more than 100 million. So with E. coli and MRSA, Staphylococcus aureus, in 24 to 48 hours, three of our mushrooms dropped the colony counts, the viable colonies of E. coli and Staph, from more than 100 million to less than 10,000 to 100 in 24 to 48 hours. Tremendous success. So we knew that agaricon, this is a mushroom that I've been fascinated about for all my life. My dear professor, Dr. Michael Bug, found his first agaricon this past fall after hunting agaricon in the old growth forest for 40 years. And so we have been exploring and trying to find this mushroom. It's extremely hard to find. And so it had a reputation back in the time of Dioscorides in 65 AD as a treatment against consumption, later didn't be known as tuberculosis. So we tested these mushrooms, and in fact, they were active against tuberculosis. And this is the oldest living mushroom in the world. It lives for up to 100 years in age. It has this amazing transformation of forms. It can take on the Venus of Willendorf form. When it dies, it looks like the backside of a healthy-looking lady to me. It can look like a foot. It can take on the Ganesh form. You know, this thing is incredibly mutable. Um, and so National Geographic gave me the Green Ovator Award. Still don't know what that means. But they wanted a story on me. And they wanted to come out in January. And I said, you're from New York. You don't understand. You can't come out in the old growth forest in January. It's too much snow, 20 feet. You know, can't get up there. So I said, come out in July. And so we rented the uh, uh, as motor sailor in British Columbia. And we went up the inlet passage, Desolation Sound. And, and, and he said, well, how likely is it we'll find a Garicon? I mean, it took me 20 years before I found my first one. 
I said, oh, 50, 50. He goes, you know, I'm on a schedule. I'm writing an article. I need to make sure we find a Garakon. I go, well, I wasn't going to tell him it was one in a thousand chances we'd find it. So I said, sure, we'll find it. And I had good reasons to say that because I t we took 10 of our friends and they had high, high power binoculars. And a Garakon only grows on old growth trees, usually with bald eagles on top and usually living snags. They're broken from lightning strikes and whatever. And the, a Garakon looks like a big beehive. So I figured about 10 friends on a motor sailor would go and try to find that Garakon. So we motored and we motored and we couldn't find it, couldn't find it, couldn't find it. It was getting a very long day and we had a retina burn. Five seconds on a tree, five seconds on a tree, five seconds on a tree. You know, you do that thousands of times, it's like your brain is just like, okay, enough. So our skipper said, well, let's go over to a Native American first people indigenous site that we don't know what the, what the pictographs mean anymore, but it's a very interesting place. So we motored over there and oh my God, we couldn't believe what we found. In this tree here, we found an agaricon. And it fell from the upper branch, from a storm or something, dropped onto that lower branch, teeter-tottered on it, the mycelium grew back into the tree, and then it grew, grew two legs. You know, so it's a phenomenal. So, oh, the National Geographic guy's excited, everyone's excited. Scott Franzblau, the top tuberculosis researcher in the United States, came with us. Here is Scott, and he's one of the pictographs. And for, unfortunately, for the lack of time, I can't go into the origination myth of women with a haida, but Gujal, our respects to Gujal, is the chief shaman of the haida people, were decimated by smallpox, and they carve plates speaking to the origination myth of women, and a garakon was in the canoe that paddled the Sea of Eternity to discover genitalia. So a garakon is very important to the haida, but Gujal said, two smallpox pandemics, two flu pandemics, we lost our ancestral knowledge, Paul. So Dustin and I feel it's our mission to return the Garakon to the Haida. So we were there, and this is an overhang of about 30 feet, and you're out of, the, out of the wind, you're out of the rain, you're right on a really rich salmon-bearing area, shamanistically, uh, this is a power spot because of a confluence of advantages, and had a Garakon growing around there, and the, the first peoples who were suffering from tuberculosis as well as pox and flu viruses. So we were there, and then um, we're, you know, it took me a long time, and then we see this rock. We're looking at this rock going, wow, look, how weird, look at this rock. Now here's the rock, here's a garricon, here's the rock, here's a garricon, here's the rock, here's the garricon. you get the picture here? So we're like, okay, how likely is it we would find a garricon? I don't know, one in a hundred maybe. How likely is it we find a, a garricon in a shamanistic place that speaks to, a, has a pictograph that speaks to the origination of, of women in the Haida myth? I don't know, one in a thousand. How, how likely that we would find a Garakon, you know, uh, in a place that had a rock that looked like the shape of an Garakon, like it was carved. I don't know, one in a million. How likely is it we would find it on my birthday? <laughs> <laughs> and this is when the National Geographic photographer turned sort of trembling and shaking uh, and looked at one of our friends and says, does this happen to Paul and Dusty often? <laughs> and my friend looked at him straight in the eye and said, yes. And I think this speaks to a greater scientific truth. If you're true to your heart, you respect First Peoples. You respect and you want to preserve biodiversity. You can call it what you will. You can call it God. You can call it Gaia. But nature will reward those people who respect nature. Let me shrink this down. Here's a dead tree is snag. Let me give you an idea. Second. All right. Nature uh, will reward those who respect nature. Uh, love, Paul. Um, all right. We are out of time today, uh, but we will get into a discussion about that. So please do me a favor. And um, wow, I don't know. There's just so many awesome things. He's, he's getting <clears throat> to two or three. Uh, I think he should be one of everybody's idols if we really want to do awesome work and save the planet, this guy is, is the real deal. Um, anyway, uh, so please watch. There's only about 10 or 15 minutes left. I know some people have to go to class. Pick it up there and we will start with the discussion and then we'll get into chapter four on Thursday. But he's got like three more points, I think, that are each solutions really, really, really amazing. And one that relates um. Yeah, very personally. So anyway, uh, any questions uh, about that, uh, about where we're headed or anything else? All right. 
Fantastic, everybody. Um, you know, if we were going to have class once in a while, I'd watch this in class and you wouldn't have to take your outside time. So that's why I wanted to do that today. We just took an exam. Uh, I think it's worth it since you're here to watch that. And we've got a lot of people that are. So now you can go about your business or finish that video. Um, and then, yeah, I hope you are all staying warm. Be good people. Do good things. Mask up. Be safe. And uh, like we said at the beginning, or I said at the beginning of the class period, uh, don't be afraid to challenge misinformation, right? With this Texas piece, 80% of the state is powered by fossil fuels. So we can't put, you know, 4% of the blame or 100% of the blame on something, you know, so, so stay conscious, stay mindful and engaged. And especially, I guess, stay warm, stay warm, y'all. Peace. Take care. I'll post this in a little bit.